Welcome to the Columbia Museum of Art. Um, and we are representing today Friends of the African American Art and Culture. We call it FAAAC. Um, if you're interested, please join the Columbia Museum of Art because we've got so many things going on, as well as uh, the, our Infinity Group, which is Friends of African American Art and Culture. You can join that as well. My name is Nancy Tolson, and I'm going to be one of your storytellers today, along with Donald Sweeper. Raise your hand. There you go. Jeanette Samuels, raise your hand. And Darian McLeod, raise your hand. There you go. And we're going to tell you some wonderful, wonderful stories. Some of them you may know, some of them you may not. We hope you enjoy them because you know what? Whenever a storyteller speaks, they never do the same story the same way. So you are getting some original stuff tonight or this afternoon. Um, I want to thank again you all for coming. Um, no flash on your um, phones, please, um, but everything else is fine. We're having this recorded, so you don't have to do that either, so you don't have to be kind of rude and holding up your phone in front of somebody. That 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 bothers me these days. I try not to be violent uh, in regards to it. You know, I was at a concert one, and it was last night, and the guy was on a date, and the sister had her phone up the whole time. Why? I was like, what kind of date is that? You know what I'm saying? You wouldn't do that, would you? I mean, seriously, you know. But anyway, so you don't have to do it. It'll be on YouTube, um, along with our other two um, from the past two years we have on YouTube, which I watched last night like I had never seen it before, nor was I in it. I laughed so much I had a good time with myself. So sit back, relax. If you have to, there's some seats. There's a seat here. I feel like an usher. Usher, raise your hand and say if you have a seat next to you. But we have seats. Don't be afraid. Um, and if you want to, if you feel casual enough, you can um, sit on the floor or something. But we are, I'm just so happy to see everybody. So um, without further ado, I'm going to start with telling you about Donald Sweeper. Donald Sweeper is going to come. And you're doing Gullah Geechee stories. I am so excited. This is our first experience with Donald. So please. Give him a heartfelt round of applause. It was way back in 1955 when I was about four years old. We lived in Danburg, South Carolina. My father was a teacher at Richard Carroll's high school. My mother was a homemaker. So one day we were playing out in the yard, me and my oldest brother. He was five and I was four. And we got hungry, and we ran up to the house and asked my mother, Ma, there, is Dunna done done? She said, no, Dunna is not done. Go in the yard and play marbles, and I'll call you when Dunna's done done. We went back in the yard, shot some marbles. Then my brother ran up to the house and said, Ma, there, I'm very hungry. Is Dunna done done? She said, no, Dunna is not done. So she said, but I'll give you a half a cookie. Oh, he said, oh, we good. I don't want it to spoil your appetite because you might not eat your food once Dunna's done done. So he ran back out in the yard and told me, Donald, look at what I have. What I have a cookie. You want a piece of cookie? I said, no, I don't want no cookie. I want a piece of candy. So I ran up to the house and asked my mother, Mardell, can I have a piece of candy? She said, I knew it right now. And you're not going to eat your food once done is done, done. But she relented and gave me a piece of candy anyway. So we went back out in the yard and played. And look down the road, here was my father coming from Richard Cow High School. Me and my brother ran, and he picked us up in his arms. And he looked at us, and he said, boys, what are y'all doing? Oh, we're just shooting some marble, daddy, until done is done, done. He said, but done is not done yet. He, she said, he said, she said, my mother said, yelled at him and said, no, Dunna's not done yet, but I'll have it ready in about five minutes. So 
So five minutes came real quick. And she said, boys, y'all can come on in because done is done, done. We ran into the house and washed our hands and sat down to the table. And she said, Donald, I want you to say the grace. I said, Lord, thank you for this food. And thank you for us playing in the yard in which we had a lot of fun. And I praise you because dinner is finally done, done. Thank you. Thank you, Donald, for the dinner done, done. We weren't allowed to ask that question in our household. You just wait until the dinner was done. Or we be done. Next, we're going to have Jeanette Samuels. My name is Jeanette Samuels. You can call me Mama J. I'm going to tell a story in my own unique way. So sit right back and rest the spell because I've shown sure enough got some stories to tell. The story I'm going to tell is a Nazi's tale. A Nazi's good day. Now, you know, a Nazi was a trickster. He never wanted to get work done because he was always trying to get out of work. And he was greedy, always thinking about eating, always. So this day, something bubbled up inside of him and he said, I'm going to have a good day. And his wife couldn't believe it. She had made a seven layer cake to take over to Granny's and she made a beautiful breakfast. Why she said, if this is your good day, I'm going to have you take this cake over to Granny. And he said, well, yes, it's my good day. Not only am I going to give her the cake, I'm going to help her plant her garden. She's been asking me for the longest. And today is my good day. And I'm going to do it. So she fixed his favorite breakfast. Why he had plantains. He had some cocoa bread. Why he had grits, eggs, bacon, sausage. He had Belgian waffles. And he had his wonderful tea, his favorite tea. And then he had a second helping of each. Now, she prepared the cake. She said, I'm going to give this to you to take with you. And so Anansi went and got dressed. He put on his pants. He put on his top hat. And he said, I'm ready. She gave him the cake. And she said, now you remember, this is your good day. And I may need some help out there, young people. I may need you to help Anansi remember that it's his good day. Can y'all do that for me? All right. So Anansi took the cake. He set out toward Granny's. He went up the hill, down the hill, around the bend, and through the tall, tall grass. And there he was at Granny's. And he, he said, I have to tell you, Granny, I really was tempted, but I didn't eat any of this cake. And she examined that cake. She couldn't believe her eyes. Why, it was true. He hadn't taken one bite out of that cake. Wow, this really is your good day, Anansi. It really is. He was so proud of himself. Mm -hmm. So she said, I'm going to give you these seeds. I want you to plant them over there while I'm going to go plant over here. And he got started. And so to make the day go faster because he really hated working. He sang this little song he made up. First dig a hole, then plant a seed. I am a good little spider indeed. First dig a hole, then plant a seed. I am a good little spider indeed. First dig a hole, then plant a seed. I am a good little spider indeed. Until Granny noticed how hard he was working and she went straight into the kitchen to prepare her famous beans. Now her beans were like no other. People from miles around would get a whiff of those beans and they would stop what they're doing and they'd yell, Granny's famous beans. And they'd run to her house to have their share because she always made enough for everybody to eat. So Anansi was still planting and he got a whiff of that smell and he starts saying, first dig a hole, then plant a seed. I am a good little spider indeed. First dig a hole, then plant a seed. I am a good little spider indeed and ended up right smack in the middle of Granny's kitchen. Now, he smelled those beans. He went over and got her long handled spoon, dug into that pipe, and he said, I know this is my good day. I know, I know. But I got to have some. I got to taste them. It would be good for me to taste them to make sure they're okay. Should he taste them, boys and girls? No, he shouldn't. But a Nazi let those the smell of those beans get the best of him. 
while he went over and got a great big scoop, took off his top hat and put him inside, and he's commenced to eating. Mmm. Mmm. These some good beans. Granny outdid herself. Mmm. Mmm. It's so good. I got to taste some more. Mmm. Mmm. Woo. They're so good. And by this time, the farmers nearby got a whiff of that smell, and here they came running. And they weren't just any ordinary farmers. No, they were big, muscle-bound farmers, and they were running with all their might to have their share. Now, Anansi heard that, that thumping, and he said, uh-oh, what am I going to do? Oh, what am I going to do? I can't let them see me because this is my good day. Well, he took that hat with those hot beans inside. He put it on top of his head. Ooh, it was hot. Oh, they came in and they looked at him and they said, Anansi, what you doing? He said, oh, I'm doing my hat shaking dance. I'm doing my hat shaking dance. Ooh, ooh. And those beans came right down his face. Boiling hot. Why they were so hot, they just melted the hairs off his head. Mm-hmm. And they looked at him and they said, Anansi. And Granny said, I thought this was your good day, Anansi. Anansi was so ashamed that he went out that door. He asked that tall, tall grass to split open so he can go in it and hide. And you know what? To this very day, you can find spiders in the tall, tall grass. All right. Now, don't you be like a Nazi. Today, Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday is a day of service. So you be of service to someone in need. And don't let a Nazi's tricks fool you. Thank you. <laughs> let that be a lesson to all y'all. Don't eat all the greens. I know, me too. But I, I just kept thinking about cornbread with them greens. <laughs> so I, I was in another place. So now we're going to come at, I mean, so he's going to come to the stage. We're going to come. We're going to come together. Come together. Um, Darian McLeod, who's a renowned storyteller throughout Columbia. So happy to have him here. So please welcome Darian at this time. Can you hear me? My name is Darren McLeod, and um, I'm going to do something a little bit different. On a day like today, Martin Luther King's, uh, the celebration of Martin Luther King's birthday, we have to think about history, writ large and small. And I want to tell you something about my own personal history that is part of our storytelling history. 30 years ago, when I first started telling stories, I used to work with this woman. I, I, I don't know, I don't see this woman who used to tell stories here locally. Well, all over the place, actually. Her name was Gail Holmes. Anybody here remember Gail? Thank you. Thank you, Gail Holmes. For those of you who don't know it, know her, you missed it, all right? Gail was something special, man. And we would go out and tell stories. And she, her, um, you know, my storytelling name, <clears throat> my stage name is Darian McLeod because that's my name, you know? But Gail's name was Mama G. And Mama G would come in the room and she'd sing a little song and she'd do a thing and tell a story and the kids be all amped up. And they're like, okay, all right, I see what you're doing here. I see what you're doing. So Gail used to always like, you got to get a song. You have to sing a song. I was like, no, I am not a singer. You sing the songs, I'll tell the stories, all right? So we'd always go back and forth. We'd be trying, you got to get a song. I'm not going to get a song. Got to, Gail, leave me alone about the song, all right? Do your thing, I'll do mine. So Gail is not with us anymore. So now I sing the song. All right? And I've been singing it for many years. I'm hoping a lot of you know it. But if you don't, I'm going to teach it to you right now, all right? So this is a song that comes to us all the way from Africa. All the way from the Yoruba people, all right? specifically for the Yoruba children. You know, the Yoruba children don't make no trash, all right? So what I need you to do is just sing along with me. If you don't know the song, don't sweat it. I'm going to teach it to you right now. All you have to do is repeat it to me, all right? First word is funga. Yeah, ha, ha. Hold on, we getting there. 
Next word is Alafia. Alafia. Next word is Ashe. And the next word is Ashe. So the words are Funga, Alafia, Ashe, Ashe. Funga, Alafia, Ashe, Ashe. And it goes a little something like this. It goes, Bunga alafia, ashe, ashe. Bunga alafia, ashe, ashe. Bunga alafia, ashe, ashe. Bunga alafia, ashe. Give him hand claps. Bunga alafia, ashe, ashe. Unga lafia, ashe, ashe. Unga lafia, ashe, ashe. Unga lafia, ashe. A little bit faster. Unga lafia, ashe, ashe. Unga lafia, ashe, ashe. Unga lafia, ashe, ashe. Unga lafia, ashe. Little bit faster. Unga lafia, ashe, ashe. Unga lafia, ashe, ashe. Unga lafia, ashe, ashe. Unga lafia. Can we go faster? Unga lafia, ashe, ashe. Unga lafia, ashe, ashe. Unga lafia, ashe, ashe. Unga lafia. One more time. Unga lafia, ashe, ashe. Unga lafia, ashe, ashe. Unga lafia, ashe, ashe. Unga lafia, ashe, ashe. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Gail. Peace. The most beautiful thing about a storyteller is we tell our stories to you. As I do in, if, when I teach a storytelling class, we tell our stories, right? But it's almost like your coloring book in your imagination because you're the one that fills in the colors, right? You're the ones. My first example of storytelling is always talking about basically I was walking down the street with my dog, Pookie. Now, what kind of dog did I have that was named Pookie? What kind of dog did I have? S speak it out. I'm so insulted. Keep talking. A schnauzer? Who said that? He was a beagle schnauzer. Yes. But, and that's the way you relate. That's all about storytelling. Using your own imagination, but I'm just giving you the figures around so you can fill in the colors. All right? Malik was a baller. He was a baller. He was one of the best basketball players in high school. He was destined to be a Gamecock one day. But right now, he was living in Chicago, and he was having a great time. Now, one of the things about Malik was he was a kind of reserved young man, very tall, but very, very quiet. Everyone knew he was serious about the game, and he loved to play it, and he played it very, very well. Oh, Malik was great. But he was a little shy, as I said before, and he was rather reserved. Well, you know, if you don't know, Chicago has some kind of wind. And when it is winter, oh my goodness, whoo, we call it the hawk, okay? The mighty hawk. And it'll cut. You think this is cold. You ain't got nothing coming compared to Chicago, right? You're in double clothes, triple clothes. And so it was right after his rehearsal, his practice, he was walking outside. And you know what? It was a little bit icy. And the wind swept him up as he was walking. And next thing you know, he was off the ground and swirling around. Next thing you see him, pop, he's in front of a house. Whew. He didn't know what had happened. He fell right there in front of somebody's front door. Oh, my goodness. The old couple that was in the house saw what had happened. They ran out and said, hey, hey, are you okay? They picked him up, 
lifted him up and started walking with him and took him into the house. He didn't know anything. He didn't know what was going on. They gave him some soup and some hot cocoa. And they said, tell us what happened. He said, I really don't remember. They said, well, okay, you know your name? They said, yeah, I know my name. My name's Malik. Okay, that's good. Well, you know, Malik, since you're here, why don't you tell us a story? Malik got really quiet. I don't, I don't know many stories. What? You don't know many stories? No, I, I, I'm kind of reserved. I don't even watch TV. I'm, you know, I, I read books, but not the ones you're thinking of. I'm sorry. I don't know any stories. A couple was in shock. A young man like that, not knowing any stories. He didn't have that kind of imagination. That's impossible. Well, as soon as Malik was able to get up and feel a little bit better and, and shake off all the wind and everything that happened to him, he thanked the couple for the soup and the hot cocoa. When he walked down the stairs, all of a sudden the wind swept him up again. Whoop, and now they swirled, the, the wind swirled him all the way, pow, right in front of a church. Well, this church just happened. To be holding a funeral. I know my husband's going to like this one. I didn't even think about that. Ain't that something? Coinky dink, right? Anyway, it just happened to be a funeral. And the body had not yet been brought into the, the church, right? But the lady who was running the funeral, she ran on. She said, you know, we don't have a minister of music. The minister of music is not here. Who can do this? Well, there was another woman there. And she said, Malik can do it. Malik looked around. He thought there must have been another Malik in town because he knew he wasn't able to do that. They said, oh, Malik, can you do it? So they grabbed Malik, took him up to the top, to the church, the top of the church, and put him in the piano. And next thing you know, whoo, Malik was doing all of the music. Malik was soothing the soul, calming the weary. Oh, my goodness. People were crying and railing and saying, hallelujah. Malik was turning up them keyboards like nobody's business. Wow. Malik couldn't believe it himself. Wow. Whose fingers are these? So all of a sudden, they brought, had already brought the casket down. Now, the lady said, you know what? The pastor, he can't make it. The pastor can't make it. What, what's going on? So another voice said, Malik can do it. <laughs> Malik didn't know what was going on. He thought he had just gone and lost his mind. They said, go on up there, Malik. They put him, st stood him up took him to the pulpit, pulpit, and next thing you know, Malik is preaching, preaching, preaching. He had five people join. <laughs> His service was so well attended, I'm telling people who were coming from the street, they heard him. He was preaching to the people who were living. He had talked about the person who was gone. It was beautiful. People can't believe how wonderful that church was, that's, that service was. So right after that, they took the, the, the body out, the casket. They did the processional. Oh, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. And of course, Malik led because he was the pastor. So he led it and he did all of the rituals and all the sayings. And then next thing you know, they were outside and all of the pallbearers slipped at the same time. But you know what? Malik was there to catch that body. He twirled it around and put it into the hearse. Woo! People couldn't believe that one. He was a hero that day. So they all thanked Malik for the music, the sermon, and for carrying that pet casket into the hearse. So Malik was feeling really strange, but really good about himself at that time. And he started walking. And as he was walking, that Chicago wind swept right under his feet, lifted him up, swirled him around, and threw him right back in front of that old couple's house. Old couple said, is that Malik? <laughs> he done come back here. They opened the door. They ran out and picked him up, brushed him off, put him in, brought him in, gave him some hot cocoa and some soup. 
and said, Malik, what had happened? He said, let me tell you a story. <laughs> now, the little town I grew up in, after I was six years old, was Utahville, South Carolina, down in the low country. Now, in the low country, there were very, very old, old women. Some of them were called hags. So that's what my story is about, the hag. Now, the hag, if you did something mischievous to her, she would take you for a ride that night. So when I was in sixth grade, me and my friend Bobby decided to walk home from school. And once we got home, we changed our clothes real fast and said that we were going to go up to Mr. Robert Wright's house and just go out there and just kind of have some fun, help him feed his hogs and feed his mule and so forth, because we used to pick cotton in this field to earn some money. Well, as we passed Miss Grimp's house, Bobby picked up some rocks and threw them on Miss Grimp's porch. I said, Bobby, you must be crazy, ain't he? What you done that for? He just sat there and just laughed. Then all of a sudden, the door flew open, and there was Miss Grimp. She was staring at us like this, and she said, why you on a boy throw them rock on my porch for? I could get you. We got scared and we took off and we ran to Mr. Robert Wright's house. And we couldn't even do no work over there. He said, you know, boy must be done something y'all ain't got no business doing any. I said, well, no, we lied to him. So we decided to go on back home but not by Miss Grimp's house. We went all the way around to the other side. And when I got home, I went straight in and jumped in the bed. And my mama said, Don, aren't you going to eat this afternoon? I said, no, I'm, my stomach hurting me. I can't eat right now. I was as scared as a tick. So I dropped to sleep, went there. Now, the hag comes and what she does is she comes completely out of her skin and turn to a mist of smoke and that mist or that vapor goes through the keyhole of the door or it can go under the cracks of the door the only way to keep her out is you have to sprinkle some salt down at the bottom of the door you see, or either take some blue paint and smear it on the walls of the house. Well, I was so scared, I forgot to do neither one of those. So I went to sleep, and then all of a sudden, after a while, I saw this very ghostly-looking old woman standing over me, and she extended her hand out to me like this. Come on, I'm taking you for a ride tonight. I saw no, Miss Grant, please do it. I'm going to take you all over the city of Utahville. I'm going to take you to the school. I'm going to take you around the churches. And I might take you around the cemeteries. She said, I told her, I said, uh, Miss Grimp, uh, I'm scared I might fall. She said, ah, but just the touch of my hand, and I'll keep you suspended. So I went reluctant. She took me all over town, took me back to my elementary school, in the school, and just flying around the school like this. I saw my first grade teacher. I said, Miss Welfare, help. Miss Welfare. Miss Grimp said, she can't hear you, you know. I saw some of my friends. I said, Robert, Horace. William, they can't hear you either. So she took me all around the different stores and back home. And she went through the keyhole again and brought me back in the room. She looked out the window and it was day clean. 
which is Don in Gullah. So hags cannot let the sun catch them up or they'll disappear. So she quickly vaporized and went back through the keyhole, got in her skin, and went walking down the yard. I got up the next morning, and I have never, since 1962, walked past Miss Grimp's house. Thank you. The story I'm going to tell now is by Evelyn Coleman, and it's a beautiful story called To Be a Drum. All right. Early one morning, it was misty, and Father West decided to take his two children out on the porch. As he sat there, you know, the mist and the fog was so intense, you really couldn't see them from afar, but they were there. He told his children, I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about the drum and how it came to be. Long ago, the first drum beat ever beat in Africa. The drum beat was so loud and spiritual that it captured the bodies of his people. The drum beat so beautifully that the people came alive. It entered from their hearts all the way down to their fingers and they played the drum. And he said, the drum beat is in all of us. It beats for not only you to hear, but also the animals, the animals of the forest, the animals of the jungles, animals all over the world, went by the beat of that drum. Now, he said, not only is it beating there, it's beating for you inside of you as well. So the drum beat continued until one day, men from another continent came. They didn't hear the beat of that beautiful drum. Well, they captured us. They put us in the bellies of ships. They took us across the ocean and seas, and they enslaved us. They separated us from our people. They took away our language. Why, they even took away our speech that we couldn't communicate with one another. But the cruelty of the world doesn't last. The rhythm of that beat and that drum was captured again within our hearts. And we learned that when we worked on, in those fields, that our feet could be the drums. When we stitched those quilts, we knew that our hands could be drums. When we fought in wars, we knew our courage could be drums. While when we fought for our freedom and our civil rights, we knew our communities could be drums. While we became teachers, we became doctors, lawyers, farmers, entrepreneurs, leaders, while we made our dreams drums, while we created music, we created a uh, dance, we created all kinds of beautiful art and sculptures, while we made our art drums, while we told our stories and we made our wisdom drums, while we took our history and we recorded it and we made our memories drums. Now, Father West said to his children, you too have a drum. Can you hear it? They laid down on the ground. They put their ears there. And little Martha said, Daddy, I can hear it. I can hear the drum. But Matt said, I don't hear anything. And he said, son, you've got to be still. You've got to be perfectly still. And you've got to be quiet. And you've got to listen for the magic to happen. Well, he imagined that he was floating on the pond and he was as still as he could be. And he said, yes, dad, I can hear it. I can hear the drum. I can hear the earth's drum beat. And he said, now that you can hear it, you know how to create the beat within yourselves. You know how to create your own, create your own rhythm. And they did. He grabbed them by the hands and he walked with them as they listened to the rhythm of the earth's beat. Now, you know that Elizabeth Catless art was a drum. You know that the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is a drum. And there's a drum inside each and every one of you. And you will fulfill your dream. Boom, 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 boom. All right. Now, I listened to my brother beating his drum and I danced to the beat underneath the sun. Thank you. How you guys doing? Good, 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 good. All right. So um, 
True confession, all right? When Nancy asked me to tell stories today, I said, cool, I do that. You know, Columbia Museum of Art, Elizabeth Catlett, MLK Day. Yeah, I'll pull out one of my special stories. Yes, I don't get all dignified on y'all. Anybody know James Weldon Johnson? James Weldon Johnson is one of the great storytellers of the 20th century. And he wrote this piece called The Creation. I do a particularly dramatic take on the creation. <laughs> but guess what? I ain't going to do that now. Because <laughs> we got all y'all on stage, man, and I feel inspired. I want to have some fun, and I want to have some fun with you guys. And I actually want to do a story that I do almost every time. Anytime I get little people in my audience, I do this story. But before I do this story, I have to say a couple of things. One of the things I want to say is shout out to Steve Wise. Steve Wise was a kid I played high school football with who taught me what storytelling was. Shout out to Steve Wise, all right? Other thing I want to say is I have a question for everybody here who can hear me. Everybody under the sound of my voice. How many storytellers do we have in the house? Raise your hand if you're a storyteller. I see a couple. Oh, yeah, I knew. I kind of, yeah, I kind of knew that, yeah. Yeah. All right, all right, all right, put your hands down. Now, when I ask this question again, I need everyone who could hear me to raise their hands because we're all storytellers, each and every one of us. You ever been to school and something happened funny at school? You can't wait to get home and tell your mom, your dad, your auntie, your uncle, your brother, sister. You ever done that? You are a storyteller. You ever been home? And something funny happens at home. And you can't wait to get to school to tell your teacher and a lunch lady and a principal. You are a storyteller. Have you ever picked up the phone and went, girl, you ain't gonna believe what he has done now. <laughs> you are a storyteller. So when I ask this question again, I want everyone to raise their hand in the affirmation. How many storytellers do we have in the house? That's what I'm talking about. All right, so right now, uh, we are going to learn a story together, right? This is a story. I think of stories. I call them presents. I call them little gifts. The things that we give to each other. The only reason, the only way we have stories is that we give them to one another. Okay? So now I'm going to give you a story that you can give anyone at any time, all right? But the story begins with a question. And my question to you guys right now is, what is this? <laughs> Correct, this is a thumb. This is a thumb. But because we are storytellers, this is also a little boy. He's got a funny looking little boy, but he's still a little boy. Everybody put your little boy up. <clears throat> Everybody put your little boy up. <laughs> All right, we shall call him Langston. As in Langston Hills, we shall call him Langston. Everybody say, hey, Langston! Hey. And this is his house, and he lives inside his house like this. Now, if this is his little boy, then this must be a little girl. We shall call her Zora. Zora, as in Zora Neale Hurston. Everybody say, hey, Zora! Hey, Zora! And this is her house. And she lives inside her house like this. Now, one morning, like he wakes up and he pe peeks his head outside his window like this. And he says, hey, it's a beautiful day. I think I'll go visit my friend. So then he opens his door. Then he goes outside and then he shuts his door. And then he goes up the hill and down the hill and up the hill and down the hill and up the hill and down the hill and up the hill and down the hill until he kisses Zora's house. Then he knock, 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 knock. Nobody answers. So then he knock, 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 knocks again. Still nobody answers. So he figures, hey, Zora must not be home. I'm going back home. So then he goes up the hill and down the hill and up the hill and down the hill and up the hill and down the hill and up the hill and down the hill until he gets back to his house. Then he opens his door. Then he goes inside and then he shuts his door. And the next one is another beautiful morning. But on this morning, Zora 
She wakes up. She peeps her head outside her window like this. And she says, hey, it's a beautiful day. I think I'll go visit my friend. So then she opens the door. Then she goes outside. And then she shuts the door. And then she goes and 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 until she gets in Lex's house. Then she knock 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 nobody answers. So then she knock 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 knocks again. Still nobody answers. So she figures, hey, Lexa must not be home. I'm going back home. So then she goes and 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 until she gets back to her house then she opens the door then she goes inside and then she shuts now the next one is another beautiful morning. But on this morning, both Langston and Zora, they both wake up. They both peek their heads outside their windows. And they both say, hey, I think I'll go visit my friend. So then they, then they, and then they, and then they go, and, 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 until they almost run over each other. And say, oh, you almost hit me. No, you almost hit me. And they stand like that all day long. Just I'm um, uh, singing songs, dancing, dancing, playing plays, just blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. All right, everybody say hello with me. Here we go, here we go. Blah, blah, blah. blah, blah, blah. That's right, all day long until finally, finally, street lights come on. You know what that means when the street lights come on. That's right. Bye bye, I gotta go, I gotta go. Bye bye, bye bye, I gotta go, I gotta go. And then they go. And. 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 And, 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 until they get back to their houses. And then they, and then they, and then they, and then they go to sleep. Good job. You are all now dyed in the wool car carrying storytellers. That is a present. That is a gift that you can give to anyone at any time. Or you could give them another gift, a story that you made up, a story that you heard, another storyteller tell. Just tell stories. Okay? Will you guys tell stories for me, please? Yeah. Well, well, all these people are like, yeah. Wait, wait. Will you tell a story for me, please? Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Peace. When they shut the door, they forgot to put the alarm on. <laughs> You're going to have to put that in your story. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't forget the alarm. That's all I know. I want to thank you all for coming out. This has been more spectacular than I could ever imagine. It really has been. FAAAC, we thank you. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. This has been a joy and so, so very wonderful to have all of you all here. I got a premiere story to tell you today. This is the first time I've told it. This is a new rendition. I don't even know if the person I told I was telling this story is here. The mother and daughter from the T. Okay, I'm ready. I've been thinking about it all day, all night. 
So here we go. There once was a seamstress and her name was Taylor. Now Taylor, ooh, she could make some clothes. Taylor was a wonderful, wonderful seamstress. She made clothes for everybody. Y'all may know some of her clothes. She made this. But y'all may know Taylor from other people. You just don't know if she made them. She, she made clothes for Tabitha, Sergio Hudson. Mm-hmm. She made clothes for a whole lot of people in South Carolina and beyond. Now, let me tell you this. One day, she was so busy making clothes for other people. What did she want to do? She wanted to make something nice for herself. You know how sometimes we just want to take a little time just to do something for ourselves. You understand? So she did that. So she decided that she wanted a very, very nice dress. She knew spring was coming and she wanted to have something that she could walk around with and just let it flow. She wanted something that represented spring, spring in her life, and she wanted a change. She wanted something bright and colorful. So she went, closed down her shop, walked over to the next village to find some beautiful, beautiful fabric. She went to several fabric stores until she found the fabric that called out her name, that looked like her, that represented everything that she was feeling. You know that dress that you found that, you know, it could have been a TJ, but it could have been a Macy's. <laughs> it was calling your name. Brothers, y'all know that shirt or those pair of pants that call your name every time you're in it, you're happy. You may not know them like we have joy in our clothes, but we... Feel me when I'm saying to you. But anyway, she found the most beautiful fabric. She found a beautiful under slip to put on. She found beautiful buttons to attach to and make with the dress. So she went home and during her free time, when she wasn't making clothes for other people, she was starting to make the dress. Now she had measured herself several times. She had measured herself to make sure that right after dinner, it wasn't gonna be too snug. She wanted to measure herself whenever anything or mood changed her and she had had a little bit of ice cream that it was still going to be complimentary on her. She measured everything. She measured everything to make sure this is going to be the perfect dress. So finally, mm, she had the dress. She couldn't believe it. It was just so beautiful. The colors were so vibrant. Oh, the flow was just lovely and it was comfortable. And you know what, my sisters? Y'all know this one. The most important thing, what did it have? Yes, it did. <laughs> it had pockets. Y'all don't know. Y'all don't know. If you see Nancy without pockets in my dress, my husband's right behind me and all my stuff is in his pockets. Okay, y'all need to know. All right? It had pockets, and the pockets were just lovely. And they weren't those little bitty pockets. They were those... Nice deep ones. Y'all know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Those nice deep pockets. And she wore that dress. She wore that dress. And the first time she wore it out, people said, oh, where did you get that dress from? I love that dress. That dress is beautiful. She said, I made it. You made that dress? I made this dress. Oh, my God, this dress is gorgeous. I love this dress. I want one. Okay, okay. I ordered. I ordered another one. I oh, oh, there were orders of dresses all over town. Every time she wore that dress, they loved it. She had orders. She was making dresses all over in different kind of fabric, and they just loved each and every one of them. Well, you know what? She wore that dress. Ooh, she wore that dress. She wore that dress. She wore that dress out <laughs> until basically it was a little shabby and it was quite embarrassing to wear. And so what she did was she decided to lay it out and look at it flow. And she realized she had enough material for a skirt. Oh, my. She thought about it. She said, yes, I can do a skirt. She cut off the pieces that were shredded, sewed on and replaced some spots. She was a great embroiderer, so she made some beautiful patterns in the skirt. And you know what? The skirt still flowed, and it was still good. And it fit her waist real nice. 
and it fit her hips, you know, and it flowed. You know what I'm saying? And you know what was the best part about it? Keep on preaching. It had pockets, okay? And she loved the way it looked on her. And it was so great. Well, by this time, it was summer. So she could wear it with a tank top, with a T-shirt, with a, a real nice blouse. You know that skirt. You know that skirt's one of your favorites. Right now, all of y'all in your closet right now going, ooh, where is she? I haven't seen her in a while. But anyway, so she wore that skirt outside. Mm-mm. She wore that skirt outside. And when she walked out the door, hey, pockets oh my goodness it flows so well it is beautiful that is a beautiful skirt wow where'd you get it i made this you made that skirt i made this skirt i made this skirt well she got orders for skirts she got orders for dresses oh she was singing and being merry like christmas all the clothes that she was making well you know what happened though she wore that skirt she wore that skirt she wore that skirt out. She wore that skirt out. It was embarrassing by the time she finished wearing that skirt. You know, it was kind of rubbing right here because, you know, when she sat and everything. But you know what? The pockets were still strong, though. I want to tell you that. Now, she decided that she was going to lay it out and figure out because it was a full skirt, what was she going to do next? Was she, make what? No, we ain't there yet. <laughs> And so she made a decision that she was going to make a shawl. A shawl. I'll tell you later. <laughs> she was going to make a shawl. And the shawl was going to be because it was coming up fall. And she was going to need it. Well, she had so much fabric that she was able to overlay it with that slip and make a beautiful embroidery on it that basically sang with that shawl. And she was able to do fanciful things with that shawl. She was able to cover up. She was able to put it in one shoulder. You know, she was watching TikTok. She knew all of those things. How to make all those different styles with that shawl and that fabric. And so whenever she went outside, people say, excuse me, excuse me, sister. Um, where'd you get that shawl from? She said, I made that shawl. She said, you made that shawl? Oh. Wait a minute. You made that shawl? That, oh my goodness, that's a beautiful shawl. I like it. Can you make me one? Can you make me one? Oh man, people were loving on that shawl because the shawl was just flowing. It was beautiful. Every time she wore it, no matter what the style, people were coming up and they wanted that shawl. And she, you know what? She now had shawl orders. She had what? Skirt orders. And she had that's right. That's right. And I forgot to tell you, inside that shawl, there was a cute little pocket. But anyway, <laughs> she wore that shawl. She wore that shawl. She wore that shawl. She wore that shawl. Ow, ow. Thank you. She wore that shawl out. She loved it so much, but she wore it out. And she had enough fabric. And she started thinking about what could she do with that fabric? And she decided, because she, no, she had short hair like mine, <laughs> that she was going to make a beautiful, beautiful soft hat. And she made this hat that kept her warm in the winter. And that hat leaned on one side. And that hat kept her so warm. And it fit her head real nice. And it didn't show any of her skin. And when she went outside in that hat, People said, excuse me, sister, uh, where you get that hat from? She said, I made that hat. You, excuse me, you made that hat? That hat, oh girl, would it fit my head? Oh my goodness, can you make a hat for me? My, my hand's a little, I can make that hat. So now she had hat orders, shawl orders, skirt orders. That's right, she had all of them. No, wait a minute. It's my turn. <laughs> and she wore that hat. And she, now, it's my turn still. 
She wore that hat and she wore that hat all through winter and she wore that hat with love. And she, oh, I forgot to tell you, there was a little pocket inside the hat. <laughs> and she wore that hat out until there was nothing but, it was basically shreds. So she tried to figure out what she was going to do next with that hat. Do you remember what the last thing is? Terrible. Huh? She decided to wear and make some earrings. And she made some earrings and she had some gold chains. And she had made the earrings into the flowers from the dress that reminded her of spring. And she wore those earrings the first time. And when she did that, people said, oh, my goodness. Those are some of the most beautiful earrings. And, you know, y'all know I love me some earrings, right? Y'all know me. If you know me, you know I'm an earring fanatic. She, they said, excuse me, but those earrings are absolutely gorgeous. Where'd you get those earrings from? She said, I made those earrings. Hold up. You made those earrings? I made those earrings. You Wait a minute. The earrings you made too? I said, yes. She said, yes, I made the earrings. She made those earrings. She had earring orders all over the country. Now she on Etsy. She made those earrings all over the country. And I'm telling you, people loved them. And every time she wore those earrings, she was getting orders. And now she wore those earrings. She wore those earrings. She wore those earrings. Until they dangled into my hand and I'm telling the story. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all so much for coming this e this afternoon. We so, so appreciate it. Please check the Columbia Museum of Art website. We have, uh, FAAAC has so many Wonderful activities coming up. We've got Yo-Yo Landers, an artist coming in on the, what? Of January, January 26th. Um, and it'll be here. Please come, come. Please make sure you go see Elizabeth Catlett, the art of Elizabeth Catlett before she leaves on January 22nd. We also have a black collection, the diamond collection, upstairs that will be here until April. We have so many other wonderful things, including jazz next month. So we hope that you all attend these things and thank you again for coming. And thank the lovely storytellers that told these wonderful stories.